Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief. Uh, this time we're talking about the Villar Speed and Lead World Cup that just wrapped up uh, this weekend. We're about a day late. But that's just what happens when uh, a rental van plows through a telephone pole in your neighborhood and <laughs> crashes power for like 18 hours. So we're here a day late, but uh, a day better, hopefully. Uh, as always, my name's Tyler Norton. I'm the guy behind Plastic Weekly, joined as always by John Bergman, the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. And of course, you can always check his competition recaps at climbing.com. And joining us this week, uh, another guy that we found off the street, uh, some guy <laughs> named Tyson Shaney, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, you from are, from yeah. what I understand, he grew up in a climbing family and then has been coaching um, some unremarkable kids for about 20 years, but maybe he could uh, uh, flesh that out a little bit. So hello, John, but also hello, Tyson. And Tyson, do you want to give us a bit of a, an intro into who you are and, uh, and why you're here today? Sure. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity here and uh, really appreciate what you guys are doing. Uh, as you said, I'm Tyson Shaney, uh, born and raised here in Seattle, born and raised climber. My parents were climbers, uh, been coaching the Vertical World Rock Climbing Team for about 20 years. Good. This will be the 20th, 20th year this year um, here in Seattle. And uh during that time, obviously been doing a, a bunch of things with the team, but also with USA Climbing uh, and working with athletes. That's pretty much the best way to sum it up, I guess. Uh, notable athletes we've had uh, over the years, Brian Hopkins, Brett Johnston, Meg Coyne, uh, Audrey Sue, Sean Bailey, uh, Drew Ruana, Gwen Mason, Maddie Dennis, uh, and a few dozen more who are just slipping off my head right now but uh it, it's been a fun ride man and uh we're gonna keep this ball rolling for a while yeah so for, uh, some people will know some of those names certainly uh, of course some really impressive world uh international level comp climbers but also a couple names in there that are just part of the american uh route setting and competition structure in particular so um that you know yeah. your, your influence now permeates the the wider web of american competition climbing uh, so that's awesome. And yeah, of course, yeah. this is a great week to have you on, uh, given given what we're talking about. Um, yeah, I wanted I wanted to just really bust into the headlines because there is so much to talk about. And I feel like most of Tyson's input will be talking about these things. Um, John, you're up to give the headline first. And I imagine there's one or two headlines that we're all kind of scrambling over. But you get to take the first stab <laughs> at it. Don't mess it up. What's it going to be? Yeah, well... <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. My headline is about Sean Bailey, so by all means, I hope that Tyson can can uh, kind of elaborate on this, take the baton, and, and roll with it. But I, I think my headline is that suddenly for us fans, and certainly not suddenly for somebody like Tyson who has been coaching Sean for so long and seen all the hard work that's gone into it, but just over the course of the past, what, four or five weeks, that's what I mean when I say suddenly, Sean Bailey has put himself in the conversation, if not stamped his claim as the greatest American male competition climber of all time, I think. And, and specifically, oh, shit. I say that. I That's say huge. That. Here's the oh, thing. Man. And, and, you know, we can debate it, we can discuss it, but I think there are two, two really key metrics here. Certainly the greatest in, in the kind of the contemporary, the modern era, but the two metrics that I look at First of all, it's incredible that he just won this event in Villars, that he wins an event over in Europe, right? Because that has been one of the, the big talking points about the Americans dating back to, you know, Alex Puccio and Daniel Woods and all that is that they, if and when they, they do win, and Alex Johnson, of course, it, a lot of times it's, you know, it's at Vail. It's, it's at this competition that is in the United States. Well, Sean Bailey, uh, with this win at, at Villars, he kind of breaks that. I don't know what you'd want to call it, that that streak or like that tradition or whatever. But also beyond that, it's it's incredible that Sean Bailey has now won a competition in both bouldering and lead climbing. That puts him in a very rare, exclusive category in the men's division. Um, I was trying to think of other people who have done that over the years. I know that Eddie Falk mentioned on Instagram that Chris Sharma had won a lead world cup in 1997. And then Sharma won, for example, like Munich 2001, there was a bouldering competition. I think that was the infamous one where it was taken away because of the drug test and whatnot. But 
regardless, like, you know, we think of Charm as this this competitor who was proficient in both lead and and bouldering. Uh, but aside from Sharma, who, you know, what other Americans are there on that level? And and even if you look at competitors who are not American, you think of somebody like Adam Andra, right, who did it in Meiringen. He won a bouldering event and he won a lead event. I think Jakob, I'm pretty sure Jakob Schubert has done it. I looked, he did not do it in 2019. I was surprised. He won a bouldering event, but he did not win a lead event in 2019. Now, he certainly won a lot of lead events prior to that. Uh, but it, but regardless, you know, Andra, Sharma, Jakob, I mean, that uh, is... Sean McCall. Uh, Sean hi, McCall, Sean, Sean right? McCall. That, that just illustrates what I said, my point. This, this is human. elite. This is elite company that Sean is is in. And even with all those great names that we've mentioned, I don't know if anybody has done it in such a, a short window, right? I mean, we just had Vilar's. How long ago was Salt Lake City? Like four weeks or something like that, right? Not not long at all. Yeah. And and Sean won one won, won there as well. So that's that's kind of how I would state my case for for saying that that by the numbers or by those stats, Sean Bailey is is you know, the all time American male. Great. If anybody wants to put another American male in, you know, in the conversation, <laughs> I'd, it'd be an interesting discussion. But well, uh, here's like, is, here's quick, like quick, quick little argument is like, what place did he finish in last year or last week? Like in Innsbruck? Like, how did he do then? And how did he do it? Like the Olympic qualifiers and all this kind of stuff. So I'm going to come in the other side on the same point, though, <laughs> because I and I, I Tyson's a perfect guy to, to kind of argue with about this is because Sean Bailey is somebody where it feels like there's so much promise. He's obviously been an incredibly strong and talented rock climber, but he felt like he never really lived up to that promise when he was at international competitions. And that's what feels so special to me this year is that, you know, even though he's not one of those directly Olympic climbers where his life is is really focused on this one goal, he's blossomed this year. And now we're seeing what, like, I feel like should be his consistent level. Um, now it goes up and down. There's good comps and bad comps, right, that we've seen just within this season. So I'm really happy that he's living up to the kind of talent that he that he seems to have. But I still think he's kind of like a little bit wishy-washy when it comes to his results. I'm still not sold that he's going to be the greatest. Comp like, I mean... There, like there's not a lot of people to choose from when it comes to American climbers. You do have to go back to literally like Lynn Hill and Robin Herbesfeld, but like who else sticks around consistently, like aside from Puccio, right? Like Puccio is the closest you have since the nineties of having someone that was like really doing the circuit. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm willing to give him that huge, uh, um, uh, a title just yet. I think it is great that he's done it in, in both disciplines. That's sick. Like, I mean, that's, that's a small club by itself. He should be proud of that. Um, but yeah, he's still like, I'm still waiting to be sold that this guy is a hundred percent in on the comp scene and that this is like, he lives for this shit. And I really hope that now that he's got some gold medals, he's going to, you know, for me as a comp guy, I hope he's going to be more of a Yanya Garnbrett where he's all about winning as many medals as he can and not as much of a Chris Sharma who is like, well, now I've proven I can done it. I'm just going to fuck off and go do something else. Right. Like, that's what I hope. But he gets to be whoever he wants. So, Tyson, I'm curious what you you know, we, we just made up a bunch of stuff about a guy we don't know. So tell us tell us how we're wrong. <laughs> no, no, not even not even. You guys both have really good points on this. Um I, I think the biggest thing to remember when it comes down to, uh, I guess these guys living up to their potential, I guess that's a good way, good way of putting it, is that this is really all part of a process, right? And especially in the men's division where it's really rare for guys to come out at 18, 19 years old, 20 years old, and just have World Cup climbing dialed. And that's no different for Sean. Uh, for him, uh, you know, as you can imagine, we talk after every every World Cup event and from five years ago up until now, every single event, uh, the phone call revolves around, dude, what the hell? Right. Yeah. You know, if you know what I'm saying, it's like he himself has felt as though he's been falling short. The potential is there. We know that he has a chance. We know that he can do well, um, even with these two uh, two results. It, the question still remains, right? And it's not just remaining for me. It's not just remaining for you guys. It's also, you know, to a degree remaining for him. Uh, you just got to put the time in. And that's what he's doing. He he has enough of the, I guess, to be honest, enough of the 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 work ethic and mindset to want to win 
and set records as we just talked about this the other day after the event he's like dude i'm really trying to set some records right now so we'll see if that's something that he can continue if 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 that can happen but like you said 47th place in the uh in the innsbruck uh boulder the other day to me wasn't really that shocking to him it was disappointing and we talked about it and he said yeah but that's happened a bunch and if you go down the list of guys that have won uh in the past and then not made it out of the quality the next week it's actually i'm not going to say dozens and dozens of people but for sure there's been a few so for him to come back then the following week, be able to put it together uh, and win the event, I, th- I think it really shows something in his growth and maturity as an international competitor. Because to, to your point, Tyler, yeah, dude, international events sometimes, pressure's there. He's struggled, even at our national events at some times. You know, he's had a hard time with it too. But that's also part of the process and part of competition. Uh, I think he has a really good understanding of competition, just like, you know, a lot of the kids that we work with and you win some, you lose some, I guess that's really the best way to look at it. In this particular case, I'd like to see him be consistent. He wants to see him be consistent. Everyone here in the U S wants to see it too. Could you, could you flesh out a little bit about, I, you know, I don't need transcripts of these phone calls, but you, could you talk a little about the themes of, of what he feels <laughs> like he's fighting against when he has those disappointing performances over the last couple of years? Like what does that discussion come down to of what he's like, challenged by totally i i think you know (laughs) as there's been a lot now right there's been a he's he's done a lot of events and when he put he posted something on his instagram that was like and it's five years of this and i was like oh my god has it really been five years but yeah it's been five years of him doing this so it's five years of phone calls of basically saying what the hell (laughs) <laughs> uh, how did the, you know, how did I not do this? How did my foot slip here? Man, I didn't make it out of the quality, all those types of things. Um, I think now five years in, and this has been the, the most recent discussion is figuring out the mental side and how to be consistent with the mental side. We've all seen the physical side. You go ahead and you put him in a room uh, just like, let's be honest, though, most of these World Cup guys, you put them all in a room, in a bouldering room, and they're all blowing each other off the whole time, right? They're all the sickest dudes out there, and they're all incredibly gifted and incredibly strong. They've all put the work in. A lot of the time it comes down to seeing, uh, I guess, remembering what worked. You know, let's just say the weekend before, yeah, I won an event. Great. Let's go ahead and do that again. And the conversation we had just, you know, yesterday or the day before was it's amazing how quickly you forget, right? It's amazing how quickly you forget what worked because four days later, you're doing the exact same thing, sitting in an isolation, trying to put together an event and you have totally forgotten why it worked the weekend before. And I think that's just going to come down the line with more positive performances with more podiums with more you know you see someone like Jakob I man I would bet that he could just write down 12 bullet points of what worked for him for those events and then being able to redo them over and over and over again I think for the guys that are just breaking in and winning one here or you know use use Mejdi as a as an example just from the other week it's like who is this kid? Dang, here he is on the podium. Let's hope he went ahead and put down some bullet points so that he can remember the following week or the weekend after uh, uh, what worked for him. And and for me, from a coaching perspective, that's all just part of the process. I mean, we're working on that with our 12-year-olds. We're working on that with our 25-year-old World Cup champions. You know, is it's like, okay, we have a process. It changes every year. It changes you know, from when you're 14 to when you're 18, when you're 18 to when you're 25. And sometimes when you're 25, it goes back to when you were 12 on what was working at that point, because that was working really well. And if you're paying attention, which Sean is actually a, you know, pretty gifted intellectual. I know it seemed like those climberisms that go out there say otherwise, but uh, (laughs) it's great free media, man. That's such a, like a funny brand. No, no, it's so good. It's so good. And Sean loves it. And he and I, he and I, he's like, dude, I know I've made it when I'm getting those like four minutes after I win an event. Right. Like yeah, that's dude. when they're getting posted. Yeah. It's super good. But, uh, uh, it's, so he is for sure every day, you know, churning his brain on what was working, what wasn't working, why I suck. 
and why I'm better than the rest, right? It's all a mixed bag that's going on in his head. And right now he's in a really good spot, found the confidence that he needs um, to perform, but also to, if you've noticed in the events and you're watching him just say boulders because you get more of a picture of them on the ground in between attempts, his demeanor is like way different than it was a couple of years ago. It's really calm, really relaxed fall on a boulder not do it instead of storming off the off the playing field he's just looking pretty chill right and that's something he's been working on i know we've talked about it a lot and i think the other coaches that he works with too uh have been trying to get there as well like he I, he works with tande and he's currently working with roman over in over in slovenia and we both have or all three of us have said the exact same thing to each other is like yo this kid's one of the strongest dudes we've ever seen what do we got to do to make sure that he's in that proper mindset? And I think that's been the big difference for him uh, through COVID, through the Olympic qualifiers, uh, up until now. And just to throw this out there, we had this discussion after the Boulder win. Dude, if he had made it to the Olympics, these wins probably wouldn't be happening. He truly believes that. I truly believe that. I think there would just be a different focus. Um, and this year, what it allowed him to do was it allowed him to – go hang out in Japan for six months out of the last year, uh, climb with all those guys, get a different perspective, a different training style, um, you know, get away from the U S and get away from USA climbing and, and his friends here that he's been competing with for the last 10 years, uh, work with some different coaches and go outside climbing, hang out with, you know, D woods and Jimmy and all those guys and go do that cool, fun stuff. And, and just sort of broaden his horizons and show himself, to the world like hey yeah i climb comps yes i want to win everything of course that's why i'm doing this but at the same time dude i'm a rock climber and that's what i really want to be doing is i want to be doing all the stuff and i think had he qualified for the olympics and maybe we can talk about this more later but if he had qualified for the olympics a lot of those opportunities wouldn't have been there the opportunity to basically just do what he wanted to do and uh i I think that made a big difference because if me just knowing him and those that do know him and you guys can probably tell uh, Sean wants to do what Sean wants to do, right? Is, is he's one of those guys who it's not like buck authority. That's not it. It's just like, Hey, I'm doing my thing. I'm going to be over here while you guys are lifting weights. I'm going to be on the spray wall by myself, you know, stuff like that. And I think that comes through, uh, in his climbing, but it also has, uh, at least within the last year allowed him to really, really focus on what was important and man, find this place that's allowing him to in World Cups, man, which is nuts and awesome. Tyson, can I ask you, you know, how close was he after the Olympics, after the Pan Ams? Um, you know, because I didn't I didn't ever speak to him, but I think there was kind of this pervasive thought among just fans and stuff that he might depart from the circuit <laughs> at that point, right? Because yeah. precisely because what you said, like he has kind of these friendships with like Daniel Woods and like all these outdoor climbers and he had climbed realization and all this stuff so it, it kind of felt like that almost would have been a good like punctuation point beyond which he could just focus on outdoors if he wanted to that's it that's certainly how i kind of was reading it or wondering what was he pretty close after the pan ams to just see just saying okay it's been a good run on the circuit i'm gonna focus on outdoors you know he and i talked about that not only right after the moment like you know when i saw you down there at that event um but the following week and honestly there was never a time in his head where he felt like he wanted to step away entirely the main thing that he says to me when it comes down to competition is i've still got stuff to do i still have stuff i want to prove sean has a like all elite level competition climbers has a certain amount of ego and and uh uh I don't know, for lack of a better term, self-worth that he he's like, yo, I work really hard at this. I've been doing this my entire life and I need to prove to myself and to others that this is who I am and falling short on that event for sure. And if you remember, the event was weird, right? It, it didn't really allow people to showcase their abilities, I guess, if that if that's you know the, the right way to put that and the format's weird it's diplomatic but yeah things. yeah thanks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah we'll just leave it at that but um sure he 
was in was in a spot where he just wanted to keep going. And I, I don't know, you know, every night and after every World Cup that he doesn't do well, of course, the phone call is, man, I hate this and I don't want to do this. Right. But then the next but then the next day, it's it's quite a bit different. So, you know, I don't think he was that close. We, he and I weren't really weren't really in that discussion. It was more like, hey, what do you want to do for the next six months? Right. And then, of course, COVID hit like three days later. And that's it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he was able to get to Japan like kind of right then and went and spent three months in Japan. So, yeah, it was crazy. It's it's just incredible. I've talked about this on other debriefs, so I won't go too deep into it. But it's just amazing to me how he really seems to have been able to turn that event, which was obviously like a huge, you know, we were all bummed for him. He's really turned that into a positive to your point of like having now the best season ever following, you know, the Pan Am, what happened there. It's just been, it's been incredible how he's been able to kind of take that, which could have easily been just considered like a low point. And he really kind of has just used it as like a jumping off point for just incredible. Like, I mean, like I said, I stand by it. I think he's, he's, you know, in the conversation as the greatest American male comp climber of all time now. And, and I can't help but wonder if maybe that wouldn't have happened if, the Pan Ams had gone differently, like, like you said. Yeah, I, you know, John, I totally agree. And I, I think, and he and I both agree on this as well. And he brought it up with me. And I, I think it was the perfect opportunity that he seized. Uh, I think that's a good way of putting it is that he was just, he was like, okay. And, and let's be honest, man, like, dude, with the format and stuff, he's not a speed climber. He was never into the format, right? And I don't want to put words in his mouth and I don't want to, you know, I, I know, you know, a lot of a lot of folks expected him to make that and or, or make the make the Olympic team. And and, you know, his the conversations that he and I had was he said, well, it should be me. You know, he believed it should be him. Of course, you know, it, it's sort of right up there. But let's be honest, man, like like it wasn't his best format. It's a weird event. You know, you have to be good at all three, which he's good at. He's really good at two. And he was an okay speed climber, but he was always going to be seventh or eighth place, right? In that, you know, in that round. So I think for him, this just, this just gave him the chance and, and he got excited, man. But he also got to go and just be Sean Bailey, man. He's like able to create this, for lack of a better term, brand that he's putting out there, just like the, this this attitude that people are now able to see because he's in the spotlight more. You know, he's got a lot of followers on the on the gram, you know, and stuff like that. So he's able to he's able to kind of just be who he wants to be. He's got really good support from his sponsors. Uh, Outdoor Research is a huge supporter of him and just sort of allows him to be who he needs to be. Like you know, wear the clothes, cool man. Uh, maybe post on Instagram, dude. It's cool, but. Uh, you know, do your thing. And they're, they're, they're allowing him to really get out there, do what he needs to do and, and, uh, become who we all have believed he could be for a very long time. Hmm. Yeah. Just to wrap up the, the Sean Bailey thing, um, for now, at least, uh, is, is just to mention like how, how big a win that was. And, and it's kind of too bad that, um, that it's not something that's present in a lot of these streams, but yeah, you know, looking back after, after the event, the folks in the discord did bring up like, man, when was the last time that a, that a U.S. man or even just a U.S. climber won a gold medal in lead? And you do have to go back to, if you want to include both men and women, you got to go back to, uh, Katie Brown in 99, or if you're looking for a men's gold medal in lead, you have to go back to Sharma in 97. So like Sean Bailey just ended a 24 year drought in men's lead climbing on a world stage. And that's like a pretty incredible story right there, aside from the medal counts and stuff that's going on this year. But just, you know, it's crazy to think that the USA um, has just been that absent from from serious medals uh, in lead climbing for so yeah, long. It's I, nuts. I agree. Did, real quickly, did Emily Harrington win one? Uh, she didn't win a gold. Um, she she won oh. silvers and bronzes. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, I, th- I I agree with I agree with you, man. And that that's sort of you know, John and John, you and I were talking about it the other day. Is it's like, wait, where do we get these stats? Okay, man, these are hard to find because of course in U.S. no one really. It's not that people didn't care, man. You know what I mean? But it's just not out there, and it hasn't been that prevalent. And yeah. You know, our, our international scene was really pieced together 
for 15 out of the last 20 years. And uh, it's really cool to see it, see it come to fruition. But, you know, as and this can be a talking point later as well. But why is that happening? Right. It's happening because of the programs that are out there building these kids, um, you know, really just looking towards Europe and how they do it and not trying to reinvent the wheel like we all used to try and do. You know, it's like, OK, this is working for Slovenia. This is working for France. This is working for Germany. Let's go ahead and and, you know, get that beta and and bring it back to the U.S. and start putting that in with the uh, with the kids that we're working with. You know, well, let's use this as a segue, because my headline is uh, this this event sealed it. I'm pretty sure, according to all recorded history that we could find the best U.S. season in World Cups was <laughs> 1992. Basically, Lynn Hill, Robin Herbesfeld, and a little help from Jim Carn put together a whopping nine or ten medals, depending on how you count it. And with wow. the three medals that they won this year, or, or sorry, with the three medals that the U.S. athletes won uh, this week in Villars, uh, Natalia, um, uh, Sean, and Colin, it puts the count now at 12 medals in one season. And we're only like halfway done the season. So my headline is Team USA has their best season in history with half the season still to go. And I think this is a good talking point now just to talk about the structure of the, of the U S team and why this is happening now. Um, if it's a fluke, if it's thanks to the Olympics, if we'd still be here without the Olympics um, and Tyson, you've spent a bunch of time coaching a lot of American kids and, and working within that team USA framework. So I would just love your reflections on on what Team USA is doing right, or if this is really just luck and the kids are just aging into their their peak ages at the same time. Like, what's going on? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I think the main thing that's going on behind the scenes is that, yeah, they're all aging into, you know, the same spot. And they're all, you know, it, it just happens to be happening that our current – National champions are up there with the uh, on the world level. But if you think back 10 years ago, 12 years ago, right, that's when we really started getting involved in international competition. We've always been going youth world championships and stuff like that from however far back. But it really was late, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010, and 11 and 12 when. We started to we we meaning the United States uh, and those coaches that were involved uh, with the big programs. Um, use myself as an example, Coach Kyle from Team Texas, uh, Claudio from uh, Stone Summit. But at the time, he was uh, running a bunch of kids up and down the East Coast. Uh, really started reaching out internationally and started doing a lot of uh, camps and and those types of things, bringing in international coaches, but really looking towards Europe, obviously to uh, get the information that we needed. Plus, we all got together a lot. These guys are all some of my best friends. Uh, we've been doing this together for the last 20 years, uh, meaning the other coaches running the big programs in the country. And we used each other not only as, um, uh, I don't know, information sources, but also just inspiration. And then, man, Robin Herbisfeld, right? It's like, we, when we're talking about the biggest teams in the country we're talking about team texas stone summit and of course abc uh and you know we can even throw us in there we've won five national championships uh stone summits won i believe five now team texas has run dude like 15 national championships and abc's up there with at least 10 right so all those big programs uh have been not only producing the athletes, but also working together and talking to each other and trying to do the thing starting a little, a little while back. So you've got 10 years ago, Brooke was what, you know, 10 years old, something like that, 11 years old. Uh, Sean was 15 years old. So he'd already been going on. You've got Colin now. He was, well, he was seven years old or whatever, but <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, Natalia as well. You know, she, she was pretty young at the time, but you have a lot of years of these programs building these kids specifically for this, right? Specifically for uh, international competition. And it wasn't because the teams were pushing it. It's just that the kids had the potential and we rode with it. And, you know, even if we're not talking about international success, most of those teams are also filled with national champions, 
right? Whether it was national speed climbing champion, whether it was youth D national champion in boulders or, you know, youth A national champion in sport climbing. They're all, all these kids were surrounded by national champions because that's what these teams were made up of. So they're just surrounded by winners. So they were learning how to do this through the time. Uh, you know, you even use Nathaniel and, and a bunch of those, you know, a bunch of those kids down in Utah, which were actually really phenomenal through his, his age group at that time. Um, they were all doing the same thing. They were around a bunch of national champions. And so the coaches, we, uh, capitalized on that, I guess. And, and I don't know, tried a bunch of things and a bunch of things worked. And here we are where we have kids who haven't, let's be honest, haven't given up right? Because there was a long list of really strong U.S. athletes who didn't at the time have the support that uh, uh, a lot of the other federations had. So what was the point? If they were going to go ahead and spend 20 grand of their own money per season just to go fly around and try and win some World Cups, dude, that's so heavy, man. It's like nothing anyone's trying to do. But now with the type of support that you're getting from USA Climbing, um, and the money that's involved with USA climbing, I think it's that that's why this is working. Uh, not to say USA climbing is why it's working. What I'm saying is that the culmination of all of those things is why we're starting to see this now. And a lot of our programs, uh, in the U S have a bunch of kids that are sitting there waiting, man, and they're going to be there too. And I'm pretty excited to see it, uh, five years from now, six years from now, 10 years from now, when the U S is able to keep this consistency. And I truly believe it can happen. Yeah. Go ahead, John, if you have some. Yeah, I was just going to say that that's, it's interesting because it's almost like you can't even compare. Let's say this wasn't the best year ever. Let's say this year was tied with 1992, Tyler. I think that's the year you said. Even if it was the same, you can't compare them because 92 was really, to your point, it's really on the shoulders of Lynn and Robin, these kind of like two standout stars. And I know Jim Carn, you said, had a, had a victory there too. But the thing that is most amazing to me so far this season is the success has really been spread uh between you know brooke colin natalia sean like like it really it is not just one athlete kind of shouldering all of this um yeah, it's, it's five different medalists exactly and and yeah, so, emma and I, hunt's just throwing her in there as well if, if we miss and one emma yeah. Hunt, thank you. yeah yeah and, yeah, and, yeah. Totally. and and on top of that you have like nathaniel who hasn't podiumed this year yet he's an olympian right so there's accolades there as well um that just kind of proves tyson's point about it's it's not just like you have this these one or two incredible kind of phenom talents it's that this has been cultivated and fostered through a system and the proof is that it is it has produced multiple people that are at that level rather than just like one insanely raw talent you know something like that yeah, some let me let me just uh, jump in real quick. After the uh, Innsbruck Youth World Championships, twenty eighteen, twenty seventeen, uh, seventeen. Yeah, sorry, Youth 17, was seventeen. Yeah, yeah. So I was a part of that coaching staff uh, for that time, and that was really our our. We'd done fine for years before that, of course, but really that was our breakout year. Um, that was, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like Ashima, Brooke, Claire Beerfine. Uh, Colin Duffy, uh, Drew Ruana, um, man, I, I got a bunch of names slipping my mind right now, but it was the most medals we'd ever won. So one thing that we did, uh, and a bunch of the coaches, not just us coaches, but as well, the international coaches, the guys from Europe and everywhere else, uh, sort of in between the, or in the middle of the event, we're all like, Hey, we should start a, uh, forum or whatever, you know, just on Facebook, little international coaches forum thing. And so by the time the event was done and we all got back to our places, one, the first question that came across uh, was, hey, U.S. coaches, what are you guys doing over there? Right. And I mean, of course, it was just an honor to even be thought in that in that sense. Like we're all thinking like, man, it's Europe. You know, they're the sickest. Japan, they're the sickest. We're doing those things. Um, but really, I. I been a long time right now a pretty long answer and the biggest thing that i think we have going in the u.s that most countries don't have is we have giant climbing teams and you go to any big gym in the country and they have a really big climbing team you have dozens and dozens and dozens of kids getting trained for competition climbing in europe they do not have that 
they maybe they're starting it now at least back then they really didn't have that much it's it's the countries are smaller there's not a I, I couldn't give you the exact reasons, but uh, my friend Urs, who runs the, you know, is a German national coach. After that year, I think maybe it was a year later, he said, hey, I'm coming to the U.S. on a sabbatical. And he, you know, got together with me, spent a week here in Seattle to just sort of see what our program was doing, spent some time with Robin uh, in Boulder, spent some time in Atlanta, spent some time in uh, – san diego with the, uh those folks as well just to see what the big climbing teams were doing because i think for them the biggest like when they said oh we don't have big climbing teams i was totally shocked i just because we'd been doing it for so long and it was just a thing it seems like a very american thing yeah you get a bunch of kids together and you compete them from when they're four years old and you try and win everything and that that, that sort of deal dude they weren't even competing their youth d athletes over there yeah it wasn't even a thing so um Anyways, I think I think that, like to your point, John, and, and my point as well, is that we have big climbing teams. They've been trained since they were little, and we have a really big country with thousands of athletes that are trying to do this thing. So of course, it makes sense that at some point, you know, you throw enough stuff at the wall and stuff's going to stick. It's just, you know, starting to move in the move in the right direction. I want to just couch up John's point where he mentions that these medals this year are spread out over more athletes. It's also spread out over more disciplines, right? Like in 92 in particular, all of those medals were in lead climbing. Um, and in the couple of years around it, where it was also a very high medal count during that like Robin Lynn era, you'd get like one speed you know, medal here or there, like maybe one boulder medal at like a top, not even technically a World Cup. Um, but yeah, so seeing it spread out over the disciplines is also very cool. Um, yeah, that's uh, it's a really interesting point. And I haven't had a chance to talk about like gym management or like whatever, because our gym's been closed since November. So this is like a fun breakaway. But that's such a curious point, because in my era of coaching, our discussion was always, okay, emulating the U.S. model up here in Canada. That seems to work for them, at least on this continental level. But at the same time, the signals we got from Europe were so different. And we were being, you know, we had these influences that were saying, no, it's not good to be having these D competitions going on. That's, you know, not quite appropriate for for national level climbing, uh, which I know has been a discussion, I think, in the States as well about like how, how yeah. old do you take to nationals or whatever. But it was always so unusual that our, so much of our influence was coming from the States, which did not have an international pedigree at the time. You know, your best chance was like, hopefully Daniel Woods goes to like one World Cup and wins it. Like that was pretty much the best you could get. Um, whereas Europe, that's where the scene was, but there were really no youth teams to model after. And that was a really, you know, it was really incongruent in your head. Um, so it's nice. And I mean, the 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 U.S. medal score has been pretty bare for like a decade, right? So this might just yeah. be a blip. Who knows? Maybe you guys overtrained all these kids and Sean and Brooke are all going to just, you know, <laughs> burn out next year. Maybe this is all a huge mistake. But it's a, it's such a huge change in the thinking about like what, what makes a good system for developing talent on a national level. Um, yeah, it's really going to mess with a lot of people's ideas of like what is the effective way of, uh, of training kids and making a strong national program. I think it's really fascinating. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, it's, it's, and it still remains to be seen, right? And it, it's, it's a lot of it, in my personal opinion, comes down to the coaching and the coaching staff and whether or not they're doing it in a healthy way. And, you know, because this isn't Little League. You know, I think that's the that's the biggest thing we all need to remember, especially those of us that are coaching, is that this is still climbing. And at the core of it, it's still climbing and climbing in itself is a it's a lifestyle. It's a community. It's it has this special thing that we that we all really gravitate towards because it is one kid falling and everyone else being bummed for that kid. Mm -hmm. Right. And one kid topping and uh everyone cheering you know stuff like that it's 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 still one of the coolest things out there man and, and it just because they're all rock climbers and whether they're eight years old or 18 years old they're all rock climbers and sure they're trying to win but dude this isn't little league man you don't have parents on the sidelines screaming and yelling at each other it's you know it's, it's still just mellow man yeah, yeah. well said and, and and the only thing i'll add too that we didn't really bring up but in terms of an aspect that i think is helping this year, it, and I don't want to speak for Sean and the other competitors because I don't know, but just observing it, it seems like having a training center there in Utah um, and having uh, encouraging the sort of the best from around the country 
to gravitate to, to Salt Lake City and to stay there either to live or to spend an extended period of time there, which is what it seems like Sean has maybe done. I mean, I think that's making a big difference, too. They have two a day practices, you know, at the training center, which which it, which seems to be paying dividends. Um, and to that point of the community, they're able to hang out there, session together. That's new as well. That has not existed. I think the training center was built in, what, 2018 or 19 or something like that. So yeah. um, I, I think that that might play into it as well. Sure. I, I can actually touch on that a little bit. Um, as I've spoken with Sean and obviously uh, my other athlete, Quinn Mason, is down there living in Salt Lake. It's It's been a big deal, right? It's been, it's been something that uh, has allowed the U.S. to feel like they're moving in the right direction. I think for our elite elites, you know, we're talking about Natalia and, and Colin and Sean, uh, Nathaniel, but obviously he's lived there his entire life. Um, and Brooke, you know, what they're, they're using the training center for what they need and want to use it for, right? Because there's, there's a lot of resources there. And I'll just throw this out there. The, the main resource there is Josh Larson. Josh Larson is, from words of many of the athletes, invaluable when it comes down to his root setting ability, his climbing ability, his knowledge to just adapt to the climbers, which in, you know, has been a methodology for myself is it's, they don't need to adapt to us, man. We need to adapt to them. If we want to get their full potential out there, it's us figuring out what they need and us being better for them. And Josh Larson has, has been able to do that for the last couple of years with a lot of those athletes. And you see the young ones that are there now that are living in Salt Lake have moved to Salt Lake to do this thing. And they're bigger and better than they've ever been. And I can see them being fantastic in the next few years. Um, our elite elites that are, you know, on the world cup podium, they use the TC for what it was designed for. And, uh, they go in there when they can, but, you know, uh, uh, you know, Brooke and, and Natalia and Colin, I'm pretty sure are still uh, in a lot of ways on their program that Robin has set up for them and the, and the program that they've been running for a long time, but they obviously go in there. They use it for mock comps. They use Josh Larson cause he's amazing. And obviously Meg coin, who's been working down with the program for a long time. They've, they've just been doing a great job, man. And uh, it, it does make a big difference because it's nothing we had before. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, cool, I'm training in Atlanta. And, oh, where are you training? Oh, I'm over in San Diego. Oh, and you're in – oh, actually, I'm in Europe right now. Okay, cool. You know, there was no consistency when it came down to people getting on the same program. Um, and it's not that they're all on the same program. They're all on their own program that just sort of feeds off of each other. That makes sense. And uh, Tyson, the the one last thing I wanted to ask you about this, about Sean specifically, is is how much are you writing any of his training programs at this point, or or where's the crossover between you and and Josh, or are you just kind of like a friend and mentor at this point? Sure. Yeah. You know, he and I he and I talk multiple days a week, and it is the training conversation is me asking him, "Hey, what are you doing right now? How's that working?" cool man <laughs> right and and it's because when we're at, at vertical world climbing team what we do is we really you know we we you know base it all on repetition tons of wall time all those types of things when they're really young and then when they're you know 13 14 15 years old we really start into the training process and you know doing cycles and and certain blocks and whatever to build that base that allows them to get to a certain point but then when they're you know 16, 17, 18 years old, the conversation changes quite a bit. The conversation is is very much more of a collaboration of what they think they need and what I know they need. And then at some point, you know, they're 19 years old, man, they know everything about their training. They know everything about themselves. They're really in tune with what they're doing. Uh, it's worked really well for a lot of our athletes. Some athletes, you know, it's, it's very different. It's like they're 22 years old and I'm still writing them programs every day because that's just the way that it's always worked for them. Someone like Sean, he was very in tune with himself. And, uh, I would like to think it's because of the way he was raised with us and the way that we, uh, you know, gave him definitions as this is why this is working. This is, you know, why this isn't working, but let's be honest. He also was a weird anomaly, man. Like, at 14 years old, 15 years old, it was like, oh, okay, you can do this. Here, let's try this, right? Like a lot of experiments went, on, went, went into Sean Bailey when he was 14, 15, 16 years old. 
that taught me a lot of things about uh, an athlete of that caliber. We'd had a lot of, you know, high level athletes, but nothing like that, dude, that's just a, a weird place to be as far as elite athleticism. And so now, you know, the conversation is, like I said, what are you doing? How do you feel? Do you need to change anything? And then he goes and, and just works with whoever's really around in the places that he is and, and get some good information, but it really is all his program. He gets some stuff obviously from Josh Larson. He, he, as far as root setting goes and, and stuff like that, like they need to be able to train on the stuff that they're going to see. And Josh Larson's root setting and the root setting that's going on in the TC is, has been helping him a lot, especially when it came down to comp boulders this year, because Dude, he spent six months outside on boulders and then went to the TC and was like, I hate this. I suck on these things. I'm terrible. And then within three weeks, he's winning a World Cup. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wrote, I wrote an article last year about how we're in an age when comp climbers, elite comp climbers are, are really starting to only do comp, comp climb, indoor, you know, gym climbing and stuff. And then the pandemic hits, all the gyms close and all these comp climbers go outside. And I'm like, oh, well, that's like, you know? totally, totally. I mean, the conversation always is the conversation always is, well, comp climbers are just comp climbers and they're not going to be that sick outside. It's like, dude, man, you take any, you take any of these guys and girls and you take them to Bishop and you put them there for a month or two, every boulder gets done. Like no joke. It's, it's not, you know, they're in my personal opinion, of course, I'm a little biased, but it's like, dude, these these people are arguably the, the best and strongest, most well-rounded climbers there are. I mean, you see someone, you put them on a big ball after they've just competed, you know, World Cup. It's not going to take them very long to figure that stuff out. Not that they want to go do that, but some of them do, you know. All right. So we, we took all the, all the, like, you know, us Sean Bailey centric headlines. So Tyson, you got absolutely, <laughs> man, wrecked, man. Totally, blow, <laughs> totally blowing it. I'm looking down at my, I'm like headlines. Oh uh, yeah. Pretty much taken. Uh, and I've got four of them here. We've already talked about them, but really when, when it comes down to, it's just, obviously I'm going to say Sean Bailey, you know, coming into his own, it's something we've all been, been waiting for. And it's not, I mean, you can imagine how it is around here in Seattle, man. He's he's a Seattle boy, and he hangs out in all the gyms here and grew up in the gyms here. And every time I walk into, whether it's a Vertical World gym or a Stone Gardens gym or a Boulder Project gym or whatever it is, everyone's like, yo, Sean's killing, you know, stuff like that. And everyone's just happy to, happy to see it, man, because they've all been a part of his his growth and his process. And, and, uh, you know, it, everyone here has helped him get to where he is and, and he will always say that. So it's, it, it, it's really cool to see. And then, then along those lines too, setting the records, like we were talking about, um, you know, first U S athlete to do this in a while. Um, you know, who knows if, if, you know, he'll be able to continue this, but I personally think he will. And, and then ultimately the U S consistency, just our top performers have been doing really well. And there's a little bit of depth there. You know, it's like when, like you can't discount Nathaniel last year or the year before he made every single semi in, in Boulder world cups. He, you know, still has been doing really well. I know he, he made a final in Switzerland. Was it right? And Marin didn't, he made it's all the a blur, final, man. And, but yeah, yeah, sure. I know, man, it's all, it really, but you know, he's still doing really well. And I know he's really close to, to being able to get himself towards the podium. I think once, once the Olympics are out of the way, we're really going to see Nathaniel come into his own. And I think he's really going to be able to start performing at the level that he, that he wants to. I'm actually really interested to see what Colin does too at that point. And, uh, uh, yeah, I feel like the, the Olympics is kind of a distraction for these guys, you know, cause it is a thing and it's, you know, the biggest thing they'll ever deal with, you know, as far as that goes, but like it can also be a distraction when it comes down to actually performing. And we're seeing that with Kyra as well. And, and, you know, yeah. And we kind of knew that going into this season. Right. And that's why it, the thinking was, I remember Tyler, you and I talked about this of like th this season is going to be sort of ripe for the pickings for somebody that's not an Olympian to really, really shine um, and, and kind of seize that opportunity because for a number of reasons, either these other the Olympians, either their focus isn't going to be there, either their training is not going to be designed for them to peak on the World Cup circuit necessarily, either they're going to be focusing on like speed climbing more so than bouldering or whatever. Um, and clearly, you know, Sean and Natalia are like perfect examples of that, right? These two people that aren't qualified Olympians, 
that are just crushing, making the most of the season. Um, so yeah, I could, t- I could talk about, we could continue talking about, uh, you know, the team USA forever. They made a podium on every, every world cup so far this, well, not speed know. climbing, but lead in Boulder they, at every, um, city so far this, this world cup season, right. They've, they've made a podium. That's incredible. There was, there was a two potentially uh, maybe two summers ago. I forget which one it was, but there was a, I was working, uh, the Munich world cup with Meg coin and, we didn't have to work on the second day <laughs> because no one made it out of qualities, right? And now here we are. These guys are putting in work every single day. They're there for the qualities, the semis, and the finals. And and from a coaching perspective, that's all you want, man. You just you just want to see that consistency. You want to be a part of the show. You want to be down there in the front row cheering for your athletes and, and doing your job. And uh, I, I know Josh and Meg are just beside themselves with the success they've had this year. And and able to really feel like they can play ball with everybody else. So there's two questions I, I want to uh, answer before we move on, just because it's all kind of approximately the same territory. But uh, first is Meg Coin is, you know, everybody has a lot to say about Josh Larson. He's become this this figurehead. He's the guy that gets interviewed all the time. I don't think Meg enjoys the the <laughs> interviews as much. Um, but I'm just curious because she's somebody that came through your system. What do you think she uh, brings to the to the um to the US I think her official title is team manager and assistant coach. Um so what's what do you think her uh, her value is to the the US system right now? Sure. Uh you know, I've known I mean Meg was with me when she was 10 or 11 years old and uh on the climbing team and she was a national team member. She was one of the best climbers that ever came through our program. Uh climbed, you know, mid 513 without being able to do more than two pull-ups you know, stuff like that. It was, it was just, her technique was flawless. She was also an amazing coach and an amazing root setter. So as far as like that pedigree of what a lot of the top coaches and, and out there have, MegCoin has all of that as well. Um, in this particular case, what she's doing for us national team, those, that skill set for sure comes through, but she also, man, she's really good on paper. She's really good at putting stuff together and organizing and, and that, she'll be the first, it, I don't know. I don't want to put words in her mouth, but she would also be the first one to say, I don't like being the bad guy, but if someone wants to yell at somebody, I'll be that person. (laughs) And, you know, when you're, uh, you know, talking to her, when she first started getting involved with USA climbing and with national team, uh, what was really hard is you're dealing with a bunch of elite level athletes, right. That are, you know, when you're dealing with elite level athletes, a lot of them are in their head and they're doing their thing and they don't want to answer emails and especially climbing athletes, right. They don't, they don't want to do stuff like that. So she's very organized and has a schedule and, and all those types of things. And a lot of them were like, whatever, dude, you know, and not wanting to do that sort of thing. So for her, um, she was able to sort of bring everyone together, get them all on the same page and, uh, you know, use Sean as an example. He doesn't really like to be a part of any program that isn't, you know, of his own, of his own doing, but dude, he grew up with Meg. Right. So it's like, you know, any conversation we're having is, is in regards to Meg, he's like, well, you know, it's just Meg. And it's like, in, in a very affectionate way, it's like, she knows me. I know her. She knows what I want. And she's also not going to put up with my shit. Like he knows that. So it it seems to work really well for him and for her. And I mean, she's just, I don't know. She's one of the best. She worked for me for five years and I was really sad to see her go. But like any of the kids, they got to go and do some things. And now here she is going to the Olympics, man. It's one of the, I don't know. I'm real proud. Let's put it that way, man. I'm proud of all our kids and especially those that are, that are putting their foot foot forward in, uh, in competition climbing and root setting and all those things. All right. Well, hopefully we won't tread on too much, uh, too much ground. We've already stomped on. We're going to talk about the big winners from the event. Tyson, you're supposed to go first for this one. Sure. Is there any I way got... you can avoid making it Sean Bailey? Is there any? Ch- 100%, 100%. I actually, I don't even have him on here, dude. All like, right. this is, I've, I've got a, I've got a few of these that I think uh, we can all touch on. Um, mm-hmm. The number one that I really thought shined through on this was the root setting. Uh, and we're, when we're talking about sport climbing, uh, the last two events, in my personal opinion, uh, were outstanding. 
I really enjoyed, well, I really want to see footage of the qualifiers because I want to see how those go. I know there was a one thing with the men's qualifier with the sort of double dyno thing that there was a scoring issue that people were having problems with. Um, but the, the semifinal and the final, man, they just looked awesome. They looked so fun and, you know, full tension rest, super dynamic risk all over the place, very three dimensional, big moves on big holds, uh, you know, talking with Sean, he was like, it's some of the best routes he's ever climbed on. And he just, he really enjoyed it. And I know the other, other, uh, climbers were really into it too. That, that for me, for the last two events has just been, been top notch. And, and that's coming after, correct me if I'm wrong, but 2019 was pretty atrocious. Am I tripping? Like it, 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 in my personal opinion, I think you guys even touched on the debrief at that point is there was just like, the sport climbing routes were not hitting the mark and this time man they are just doing their job and i really like it i feel like yeah we did if i'm remembering right it was kind of like 2018 was like the hell year and so that conversation like carried over into 29 and i think it was like maybe that was it i think it kind of catalyzed around yanya's comments at the end of i think it was the 2018 world championships or whatever and but anyway, yeah, I, th- I think I, I agree with the general point of, of these last two events specifically have been outstanding. Um, yeah, the, look, talking about the, the route setting specifically, something so, like not that I've done a ton of comp route setting, and I think I've done maybe only like one or two events of, of lead comp route setting at a really low level. But the idea of trying to get people or getting people falling low on a route isn't like generally appreciated. But I was right. really interested in how both lead routes involved like fairly risky or somewhat opaque sequences early on for the athletes that caused some really low falls uh and it was actually cool though is i guess what i'm trying to say it was like it actually added something um it added a little bit of story it didn't feel like the moves were unfair it didn't feel like it was um it didn't feel like a bottleneck either because it was only a couple athletes, right? So on on men's, there was the, and we'll talk about finals specifically in this case, men's was that left palm down, right hand up, kind of dealing with a, a press barn door situation. And and the Japanese guys, I think specifically going a little bit too dynamic for, for the positioning. And then for the women was that blind uh, right hand dino um uh, which which I think added a ton to to the event, and so uh, Tyson, just for yourself, like talking about risk in the lower part of the, you know, let's just talk about risk in general. There's been way more of it. It feels like in these last couple events. Yeah. Um, do you want to just give your read on on why it feels like it's been appropriate in this uh, in this setting? Totally. I, I, you know, having not that my comp setting experience, which to be fair was pretty extensive back, you know, for 15 years not at this level by any means, but to your point, yeah, dude, we were never trying to do that. Like early within two or three bolts, like no way were we trying to do that. I love how these guys are able to do it or they, you know, and it's always a guess, right? It's always a guess. Root setting is just a guess, but they have a really good understanding of the athletes. They're doing a great job of being able to be like, this is enough. Like th- this is enough and it's not too much. And that particular move, like the, uh, the mantle press thing, I think they knew that they were going to get a couple people to fall there and they lucked out and got a couple people to fall there. And it was, it was part of the deal. Um, it added to, from my opinion, it, it added to the show. It allowed the audience to be like, Oh my God, what are they going to do? Especially after, you know, the first, uh, uh, Philip, the first French dude, he just casually walked this thing. And then the Japanese dudes came out and just like went at it all crazy and, and, you know, flew off the wall. So it like added that to the rest of the rest of the round. And let's be honest, I'm sitting there in my house with my wife. We're both like sweating. Our our palms are sweating. And I'm like, dude, Sean can totally fall on this. Like that, <laughs> like just that mantle. Right. right? Cause it's like, it's that type of move where, where if you do it wrong, you're just out, dude. And uh, I, I think it's very appropriate because these are the best in the world, right? This is not something you're going to set for a youth B, you know, final at nationals. This is the best in the world and they all should be able to do this. They should be able, be able to accept the risk and they should be able to execute. And what you saw was you saw the athletes who were able to execute 
uh, get rewarded for doing that type of thing. I agree 100%. I love the route setting. The thing that you the thing that you always want with any of these finals is you want like as many storylines as possible, right? Heading into them. And the, what was really great is that the route setting added all of these little subplots, um, particularly, you know, I, so the, the two Japanese men, uh, Masahiro Higuchi and Zento Murashida, they, it wasn't just that they got smoked. It was that they clearly like read it wrong as teammates right or at least that was kind of the story that we were being told on on the commentary which is probably very likely right during the 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 preview they were probably looking at it talking to each other they probably just misread the beta did it dynamically instead of more statically um that's a cool subplot like that's a cool little storyline it's not just that they missed it it's that they likely read it incorrectly or, or read it too dynamically that was cool Another great plot with the women was, you know, Laura Regora tops it, tops tops the route, and then Yanya is last to come out, and Yanya has to top, but she has to top quickly. I mean, that's just like this other cool storyline. It wasn't like there were four or five tops. It was just Laura had done it, and Yanya needs to do it. I just, yeah, I cannot praise the route setting enough. Cannot agree enough with what you said, Tyson, about the route setting being a real big winner from this totally and i think for the females the coolest part was they're really throwing some dynamic stuff out there yeah they're you know they're they're getting to a point where if you notice a couple of years ago they would throw a couple really dynamic moves in there and no one would hit them you know or maybe just yanya would hit it uh this was they were very doable yet still very risky losing uh the sylvanian athletes on that on that one move um which was a little shocking but at the same time it's of course man because there's a little risk there's dynamic you know dynamic movement that type of thing i love that they're doing it for the females and uh, uh i mean it, you go back to the semis and you look at the yellow section yellow and blue section of the of the men's route and man i just i want i would want to climb that as a boulder problem i would want to go to my gym and see that and be like okay cool man this thing is like really well done and it's in the middle of a world cup semifinal. It's like not even the showcase, and it was still just so sick, dude. I loved it. Yeah, was it was it Innsbruck that had the at the top of the women's route? It was like the paddle dino, like the three, yeah, the three. Yeah. I think if so I remember called, correctly, yeah. I think I think Yanya yeah. broke it and she did it um, sure. statically instead of dynamically. But but it's just like yeah, like a paddle dino at the very top of a women's route. Like who we would have never even thought to see that in a World Cup final right. five years ago or something. That that, that would be totally. strictly bouldering. Uh, yeah, it was, it's just. Yeah, it's been really cool. I want to yeah, like I want to talk about the, the the idea of these like little storylines which are kind of like uh, I I'm I'm afraid of using the word like cruxes, right? But it's this the use of these dynamic moves basically creating checkpoints throughout the climb where in the past it feels like so much of watching a lead comp sometimes just comes down to are they tired yet? Are they tired yet? Are they tired yet? Will they make the next move? Will they make the next move? Will they make the next move? But in this instance we've got these really distinct and easy to uh identify um tests th throughout the climb uh that made it much easier to talk about because you're no longer trying to like make like a move from some generic blue sloper to some generic blue crimp when it's just a pump fest and you're just winging like crazy there was you were able to build up right like you hit the you hit the first dino she's taking a rest how's she going to make out on the next sequence you know up here or whatever and i i'm trying to I don't really know how the best way is to translate how cool that is to to uh, root setters because I think we generally try and avoid the mentality of specific cruxes or or high, like we already said like you know risky risky moves particularly low down. It seems like it is something that is remarkably high level to actually pull off well because if I saw this in a like you kind of used as an example in a youth comp or even if it was just in like an adult nationals in in the states or Canada it's it's a really high bar to clear to make that kind of root setting work well is it not like I feel like the margin for error is so huge um, yes. I don't even know how to to celebrate how awesome the route is without getting like the wrong point across to lesser root setters. Like I'm kind of like, I don't really want to go back and tell root setters and know like, Hey, you guys got to try this is fucking sick because I feel like it can only go wrong if it's not like at the top level. I, I, I'm having trouble like figuring that out in my head. To totally agree. I, I think again, the, the nice thing that these root setters have is they have the most elite athletes in the world to work for. Right. They're, they have, I think so. I was 
you know, like I said, root setting for a long time and setting a lot of comps, but also I was setting for the kids. And one thing that's always in your head when you're able to, you know, put together something that works really well is you're thinking of the athlete that you're putting it together for. And, uh, these root setters are like, okay, here's who we have in the final. And granted, you know, they put it up the week before, right. But they know the start list, they know who's coming. Um, they make tweaks accordingly. And, yeah, you're not going to get that in a youth event because the risk just is is too much. And it's more than likely not going to work, man. But when you're dealing with the best athletes in the world that you've watched pretty consistently, not that it's easier by any means, but it's just like from a root setting perspective, that's you have all the tools there. And and uh, it's really cool to see these guys and gals uh, execute and and be able to make that work because it just I mean, that semifinal for the men's uh, for the women's as well. Uh, and. And also for the the final, it's just outstanding. I think maybe maybe in that women's final, maybe not two tops. I know they were trying to get that last dino, but of course Laura is going to go ahead and you know do do the static life like she always does. But mm. you know, uh, still, I thought they were outstanding. We, we Tyler and I were I, and Tyson, you were in the Discord too. We were certain yeah, was, that she yeah. that Laura was going to get smoked by that first dino, the, <laughs> the sort of blind. <laughs> blind yeah, jump to the yeah. jug or whatever it looked kind of juggy probably wasn't as juggy as it looked but um but she did it that was that surprised all of us that were in there watching uh, i i i was you know i guess not surprised but surprised of course you know it's like no, anytime she's able to press her way out of something it's just like yeah of course of course she's going to be able to do that but had she fallen i wouldn't have been surprised either you know, it's it's one of those types of things where she never surprises me with what she's able to do. But if she isn't able to do it, that doesn't surprise me either. Do you think we're in in, in we're in a year here? Well, I guess it'll get messed up because of the Olympics. But it I, I remember I think it was last year, 2019, we were saying that I think it was Akio that we were saying this would be such an incredible season if Yanya wasn't here. Like it, like if, if it wasn't for Yanya, Akio would have, be having like the season of her life. Are we in that situation again here with Laura where, where like Laura's having this incredible season, but it's just going to, it's probably all going to get a little bit overshadowed by the fact that Yanya is Yanya and she's having a fantastic season. I, I wonder that that crossed my mind after watch, after having watched Laura perform pretty well in, you know, in the first couple world cups here. I don't, like, I feel like it's, like, kind of too early to say. I'm just going to – I'm going to mess up the order right now. I know, John, you're supposed to go next. I'm going to say right now that my big winner for the weekend was Laura Rigora. Okay. Um, or Laura Rogora. I don't know how we're pronouncing it anymore. Um, but we'll just make that the topic at the moment. And the reason I was going to say she's a big winner, first of all, kind of weird because she was my biggest loser yesterday, although, like, not really, but just bringing up that discussion uh, from last week. Um it was one of those instances where after Innsbruck, where Innsbruck, yeah, yeah, Innsbruck, where it was the dynamic moves that were stymieing her and that was starting to become a theme. And then coming into this event, it was like, oh, this theme is going to repeat itself. She's in a finals with these three sequences that are very dynamic. So the the blind right hand and then the two sequences at the top, the first dino to the green ball and then the upward dino to the finish uh and like you were saying we were all nervous that she wasn't gonna get very far she like so i think that the narrative of her hating everything dynamic probably still stands up at this point but what's remarkable is how far she's willing to go and how strong like how much she's willing to pull out to avoid dynamic movement if she doesn't have to do it so like basically going full extension into that blind reach to avoid having to make a, a very dynamic launch to it going out you know huge cross to the green ball towards the end and then of course finishing with like a really remarkable like one arm mantle press up to the finish was like insane especially with it being so down to the wire so she's my big winner this week because you know if it had been set slightly differently it might have been too much to ask of her to to keep going static but man when you give her the opportunity to do stuff without making those big committed jumps she just grinds that out and I was so impressed and of course just like you know, her win in Brianson was excellent for her, her first big win, but this felt like, uh, th this route in particular felt like more of a triumph for her, how she went through those C th those three sequences that were clearly not what she wanted to do and still made it, uh, still made it to the top. That was unreal climb from her. You could have ended the comp I, right there and it would have been almost better, frankly. I, I totally agree with you on that. And I think it's, it's, you know, we all, 
a lot of us coaches have athletes like that, that, you know, you talk to them about, Hey, climb it your way. Like if you're not going to do it the way that it was supposed to be done, just climb it your way. And she really does a good job of doing that. It is so impressive and so cool to see. Tyson, I, that brings up something I did want to ask you, which is like, if you are coaching, you know, hypothetically, if you're coaching Laura and you have mm-hmm. this athlete who is elite level, but clearly like to, to, you know, to save her life does not want to do dynamic movement. Like she will find any way she can to work around it. And it seems like it always works. She always finds a way to kind of work around it. But as a coach, you know that, and as a route setter, you know that at some point, like there will be a point where she, she probably won't be able to just sort of static her way out of something. Like, how do you work with an athlete like that? Who's so, who's, who's so good at this one style. And yet you also know that, that, the you know, the circuit is very dynamic in a lot of, in a lot of respects. Yeah. I think it's, it's fortunate and unfortunate that it works so well for her mm. um, because she hasn't been really put in a position to where it, it, she's seen a bunch of failure from it because she still continues to perform like that. Um, she's still able to be on the podium. Uh, I, from if she was my athlete and we were at home, obviously we would work on it a lot. It was something that we would, you know, every day be working on in practice, but it's not to get her to change her style necessarily or change the way that she wants to climb roots. It's just to give her another arrow in the quiver, you know, a, a, another, uh, tool that she has. Um, and therefore, if she, you know, is sitting at the third bolt and it is an absolute requirement to do this or you're going to fall, she already has that there. And I have no doubt she's working on it, man. I have no doubt that that's what's going on in her training with her coaches and, and her teammates and stuff like that. I have no doubt that that's a topic of conversation uh, every single day. Um, I would be interested to see in the next few events if the root setters are going to try and really force the dynamic movement you know the hard part for the root setters is that she is what five feet tall so they don't they don't want to uh make it a reachy thing so if they don't make it a reachy thing there's always kind of a way for her to static through it right um you know and and yanya is correct me if i'm wrong five four five 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 six something like that so she has a significant reach on someone like Laura. They go ahead and they make it uh, all points off dyno for Laura, and there's a good chance that Yanya is going to be able to, in one way or another, static it. Um, so I think they'd probably err on the side of making it the other way as opposed to reaching out uh, Laura. But, you know, I would be surprised. Or I, I interested. Excuse me. I'd be interested to see what's going to happen the next few events if they really are. Try- I think they tried to force the dynamic movement on her at this one, and she still just broke it. Yeah, yeah. That's the sense I got too. I mean, it really felt like they really wanted those moves to be dynamic from everybody. Totally. I mean, we were in the Discord. We were just blown away when she managed to static yeah. her way through those upper that upper sloper or whatever. That um, upper sequence was freaking insane. Just because at that, that point, was, that yeah, high up on dude. the wall and pulling out like that much control for the first move to the sloper, and then like on, like mantling to a finish hold. Like if you look at her arm, that like little twig of an arm, just like cranking <laughs> out to full extension yeah. after being on the wall for literally five minutes and forty five seconds like you just that's that should be unreasonable right like you shouldn't be expecting somebody to be able to pull that out so yeah anyway totally she she was my big winner from this um that's great i i agree i agree with that as well john what about you for big winners this week well i've got a couple written down here the the first one i wrote down was natalia but we kind of already she sort of looped into that discussion of team usa doing doing really well so i i won't cite her for my my big winner, although I will say it was well, just you lead incredible. off with it, but whatever you can cheat, I guess that's fine. Yeah, well, she sure. made the most of, of eking into the semi or into the finals, right? Cause initially it didn't look like she had made it. She was ninth. Uh, and it looked like Julia Shannon D had gotten the eighth spot. And then I guess there was an appeal. It wasn't really explained on the broadcast, the details of it, but it seemed like it, there was an appeal and, and Natalia ends up in the finals in that eighth spot and ends up crushing. Um, so I think there's a, you and know, nobody deserved... saw it, unfortunately. And nobody saw it. <laughs> I, I watched it. They they yeah. updated the video this morning, and I watched it this morning. Man, she looked amazing. She looked she so looked happy so... at the top. It was God, like, yeah. right, dude. <laughs> that the smile on her face, like yeah. from bolt one to the finish, was just 
just so impressive, man. I just yeah. loved loved the way she attacked that route. Yeah, she deserves a tip of the hat. But but I will say for my big winner, Kyra Condi, and and it's kind of related to our episode last week, Tyler, because Cody had mentioned how there was just kind of some questions about her with her and she and Kyra herself on Instagram was very forthcoming and being frustrated with her results and stuff. She ends up, you know, finally kind of gets over that hump um, out of qualification. She makes it into the semifinals. She ends up in 17th place. She doesn't make it into the finals, but still, I think 17th place is a, is a victory in the sense of considering the frustrations that she's been honest about. And in looking at her results, she hasn't performed bad at all by this season, you know, by, by any means. She was 21st in Mayringen, 30th in Salt Lake, um, 8th in Salt Lake City, number 2, 21st in Innsbruck, and here 17th. Like, those are very, very solid, respectable results, especially the 8th. Eighth- eighth place in Salt Lake and the 17th year. So I, I, I don't think she's been had a bad season at all. I think it's just that she's been on the bubble several times. That's what kind of the takeaway from that and her frustration with that. You kind of, it, it, it's easy to kind of seem like that might be, that might equate to a bad performance, but it, not bad at all. She's just on the bubble. And um, so it's cool. She made it into semis um, kind of focused and, and, and did that. So she's in, in the winner category for me. Tyson, I'd love to hear your thoughts just on how how Olympic training is affecting somebody like Kyra Condi. Um, like we've talked about how it's interesting how her teammates have all had extremely successful years um, coming into the uh, the Olympic year. And even though, you know, in, in my opinion, when we went from the qualifying, I thought Kyra was going to be a... a, a um, a uh, bigger threat for an Olympic medal at the time. I, I thought Colin Duffy was was less of a factor than he's turned out to be. How do you think, you know, she's, how do you think Kyra specifically is kind of reconciling where she is in her training, the fact that she's been training for three disciplines, realizing that her other teammates are having all this huge success and maybe she's not feeling it. Like, I feel like there's a lot going into that mix of of what Kyra might be coping with in her head and in her training now just like you know a couple of weeks out from the Olympics. Yeah, I you know I you bring up some good points there. There there's I just think there's a lot going on, right? And and when you're dealing with an athlete like Kyra, as I haven't you know just precursor, I have not spoken to her at all in the last, you know, since the Olympic cycle or whatnot, but her and I as well used to talk you know, quite a bit back when she was youth and then outside that and, and for world cup stuff when I was working world cups and, and, uh, I, I think Kyra's the type of person, you know, how, when they say, well, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I, I think she wears her brain in her climbing. If that makes sense. Like she's on the wall, her mind is going a million, million miles an hour. And yet her and then her body starts doing the thing, right? Starts doing all those things. She's thinking about nine ways to do this move, and then her body just tries all those things without coming off the wall. Um, and I think that probably is what's happening in her training. I, you know, Kyra, if you're watching this, man, I'm not throwing you under the bus or anything like that. This is just speculation. I think that she's got so much going on in her head, and she wants to perform. And then she had a couple in her mind bad events. And she just doesn't know how to fix it. And I, dude, I don't have those answers either, man. Maybe if, maybe if she was able to, I know Josh is working on it. I know Meg's working on it. I know everyone's, you know, working on it, trying to get there. I'm actually pretty confident, man, that by the time the Olympics comes around, she's going to be pretty spot on. I was going to, I was just going to say like, is there really anything to actually fix or is it just like, yeah, Hey, you gotta, no, you gotta yeah. shut your head up and forget like a couple of really bad results and just Dude, go to totally. the Olympics and climb. Totally. That, that I think is my main point, right? Is that she, whatever she has done for the last, you know, five years, it has really worked, man. And her climbing style, her, whatever's going on in her brain, you know, her, her methodology towards her training is it's really worked. She does not need to change a thing right now. I I do not think this is the time to do any of that. I think that if she just sticks with what she knows, uh, by the time the Olympics comes around and she's able to, you know, start building some confidence because ultimately that's what it comes down to. Right. It's like all these athletes are really, really, really good. It just depends on who actually believes it or not. 
And I think once she starts believing it again, and once she starts getting there and has a good result, and you know, the the Olympics, it's uh, twenty as opposed to seventy five, right? So there there's it's a very different field, and some of those athletes just aren't good at sport climbing, and they're not good at boulders. They're good at speed, or vice versa, or whatever it is. Kyra's pretty good at all these things, and she can place top five in every single one of those things. So I, I think she actually has a really good chance of doing well, um, potentially being on the podium, but, you know, being in the top 10 for sure, being in the top, top five potential. Um, I think she just needs to start believing it again. Cause I know that as an elite athlete, it can only be, man, I can't, it's so gnarly, right? She's the pressure's like gotta grinding. be mad right now. Like I, I Dude, can't so crazy. imagine it. So crazy. And that's to speak along the lines of our athletes that aren't worrying about the Olympics. Right. Or, you know, they're they don't have that type of pressure. They're almost they're free to go nuts, man. And 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 just try new things and do all these other things. Whereas we're talking about, you know, I, I think Brooke is really like the main one who's like <laughs> she seems to be making it work even with the pressure. Like yeah. totally. She's like smiling at all moments and like I'm totally in love the Olympics, love the training, doing the thing. Oh, and I'm going to go win some World Cups and do this, too. And man. Yeah, she's she's just a, you know, a, a bright light in this whole thing for sure. And I just I can only imagine the other athletes are like, oh, my God, you know, they're professionals. They're doing it for sure. But it, I'm sure it's overwhelming. And Kyra, I'm sure that's happening for her. Speaking of bright light, uh, bright lights, let's uh, let's darken things up a little bit. Talk about biggest losers uh, <laughs> for, for the week. I. I don't. I think you're the first coach, maybe that we felt. I'm sure Cody's done some coaching, but like <laughs> first guy that's like, you know, that's your that's your vibe. And now now we got to get you to wreck some people. I'm gonna go first. Um, my my biggest loser from this weekend is the Indonesian uh, women's speed team. Mm. Talk about you know after after seeing uh, seeing Vedrick and and Kiramal come in uh, a couple weeks ago in Salt Lake City, the hype for the Indonesian team was huge, and we were getting a lot of word that they had a lot of talented women as well. Of course, Ari Susanti Raheyu, who we all know from a couple seasons ago, who uh, who holds the current record. <laughs> Am I forgetting anything? Yeah, holds the current record six nine nine five. She wasn't present at this event, so we got to see three. Uh, climbers that we're less familiar with and it did not go their way so uh, I'm going to wreck the names but Nuro uh, uh had a false start in the round of 16 in finals uh, she was seated 12th uh, Regia Salsabilla was ranked 2nd and she fell in the round of 8 and then uh, Desak Marerita who was seated 4th fell in semis um, putting her into the lower bracket final where she had the lead the entire time until she missed a foot and uh, and gave it up to Patricia Chudziak right at the very end. So three climbers that in qualifiers showed like, hey, they have some game, right? And they were like ranked pretty high and then finals just got absolutely stolen from them. So rough, rough weekend for the uh, for the women of the Indonesian speed team. I'm sure when we get them to the next event, they'll be incredible. But this was not their day. I, I think just to correct you, Tyler, I think um, Aries, I think Yulia has the current women's record. Yulia. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. She broke it in um, yeah. at the Euros, right? Did I? Yeah. Did I mess right. it up? Yeah, my bad. Just if Yulia, if Yulia is watching, I want to yeah. make sure we give credit yeah, where it's due. Right. But Aries I, did did hold the record and certainly was, I was expecting or I was hoping that Aries would be there. I, I don't know why she was not. I, I texted Albert Oak asking if he knew anything. He didn't, he didn't get back to me. So I, that was kind of very con- conspicuous by her absence as as the phrase goes um but i had the same reaction tyler i don't have a whole lot to add but i was just kind of yeah i thought that the the um the women's in indonesian speed climbers i was expecting them to kind of clean up the podium just like the men had done in salt lake city and uh didn't really happen yeah i don't have a lot to add to that either i think speed climbing for me is just there's it's really hard man i can't imagine like training for it the way these folks are training for it and then having the results where you're one foot slip and you're just 12th right um so heinous but also that is exactly what makes it so exciting so i i feel bad for those folks that that should be you know winning but at the same time it never surprises me if they end up in 12th place just because it's speed climate and that's that's sort of the way it goes yeah, the big final in both men's and women's were kind of a bust, right? Like the uh, Yulia slipped 
twice, I think, right? And then Timothy sleep slipped versus Leonardo. So yeah. it's kind of a kind of an anti uh, you know climactic big final there. For, yeah, in this v- like Vedrick's run in the final was incredible. Like it was just funny because it looked like he didn't like the second the, the buzzer went off, he suddenly didn't have an opponent anymore. He was just going up solo after Dimitri <laughs> got uh, got knocked out. But yeah, the women's one was funny because the same thing, not not in the same situation, but uh, Yulia had a had a mess up. Uh, at the Euro Champs, um, the their the European Olympic qualifier, um, and it was in the semifinals also to Ekaterina Barishuk, uh, which put Ekaterina in the final, who therefore went to win it. So Ekaterina's two wins come off of these like particularly fortuitous runs against Yulia Kaplina, who just kind of blew it when she was climbing against this uh, uh, this other speed climber. So yeah, it, I feel like uh, Yulia might be discovering a kryptonite possibly, and it's this other young Russian climber who just gets in her head or just has all the bad luck. I don't know, man, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Tyson, what about you, big, uh, big loser? Man, you know, this was actually hard for me to be honest, like the, the loser category, because I really, you know, when you're working with athletes all the time, man, (laughs) it's, it's, you totally get it. Sure. You get it when something happens. Right. And, and you guys can relate to this as well is that it's like, Hey man, like Sean Bailey, 47th place after winning something. It's, it's like, like our conversation after that event was like, well, that sucked. And then literally just move right on. Yeah. You don't sit there and dwell on it. You're not doing anything about it. You know, it's just like, hey, it happened and, and we're moving on. That's not who you are as an athlete. And, it, you know, in a lot of ways, the conversation can be for a lot of these folks that do struggle or had a bad event or whatever it is, is this competition does not define you as an athlete. If you were 47th place, that's not who you are as an athlete. If you were first place, that doesn't necessarily define you as an athlete either. Yeah, it's got to right? be both. It's, like, I mean, you can't you can't just run around totally. calling yourself best climber 100%. in the world because you win World Cup. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And you know, with the kids, what we talk about a lot is we say, you know, we don't talk about winning unless you're winning, right? And I think the main the main thing there is that it, it, it we're not trying to put too much focus on the results. It's really the process that we're focusing on. And if you're in a position to win, then we'll go ahead and talk about that. That seems to be a thing. But if you're just trying to make it out of a qualifier, that's what we're focusing on. We're not talking about the winning. And once you're winning, then the conversation is about the winning for sure. Um, so anyways, talk about losers, man. <laughs> With everything couched to make sure the kids he coaches right, right, right. don't get the wrong that's attitude right. about what coach is about <laughs> to right. say. <laughs> South there. Vander Megos, bro, what is up with your feet? Mm. just dude and this isn't this event alone this is also hey i'm talking to one of the best climbers in the world like for sure (laughs) no doubt we all know dude this guy's so gnarly and and whatever but if i'm going to critique something it's going to be the fact that i have seen and i'm sure you guys have seen this at least five events that he has not won or ended up on the podium because his foot blew Mm -hmm. and this this was no different man he was he wasn't climbing that great in the final you know he said it himself in his in his instagram post and he looked tired from the beginning but it's alexander megos man he can for sure do this dude and he just puts his foot up there on that high volume and almost like it was an afterthought and then of course it's gone you know it's just out of there and I think had he been able to bring his foot up like Sean did into the dish as opposed to trying to smear it on that volume, I think he would have been able to get a pretty uh, relaxed position, uh, calm down a little bit, maybe get a little bit back. And then, man, his shoulders are so amazing. I could see that last uh, that last move sort of going for him. Um, I, I, I couldn't tell you which events the other ones were where, where his foot blew, but I, I just remember seeing it over – unfortunately over and over again and one thing we work on with the kids all the time is it's like if you're going to put your foot there grind it a little bit grind your toes is what we say you know you put it in there grind the toes just give your heel a little wiggle so that you get a little feedback from the hold so that you know it's in the right place whatever it heats up the rubber it makes it stickier you know this this image that we're trying to get them to create for positive footwork and uh in his case he just sort of slapped it on there and gone 
right? And I think the problem with certain athletes when they're really, really strong in their upper body, and Sean actually does this too, they're so strong in their upper body and super light and, you know, kind of paste your feet a little bit here and there as opposed to actually grinding the toes. And I think that was just the case for Megos. And and uh, could he have won the event? Yeah, totally, man. But if I was going to critique anyone, it was going to be me critiquing arguably the best climber in the world with shitty footwork. Uh, John, John, is your is your loser by any chance, Alberto? It is not. Okay, no. so Alberto. I was going to say that too. Yeah, Alberto, exact same thing, and I hate it because I'm such a huge fan of Alberto. And it like this event in particular, semifinals was a foot blow, and then in finals it was like he didn't even get into the amazing like slabby uh, you know fingertips toe tip section in the black volumes. He are some ridiculous high right lateral foot when he's trying to like, you know, make a, a big reach where he needs the power from the bottom. And it was the exact same thing. And it's just like, I can't, you know, you got to you got to not let the let the weird footwork get in the way of you winning this thing, because, you know, I think I think Sean mentioned it in his post game interview, just like, yeah, Alberto, 100 percent could have won that. Like, come on, he's he's like an endurance god. The guy's an incredible climber. And part of why I love him is because he is like often sketchy as fuck, even when he's crushing. But it just really sucks when uh, when when he's just not getting anything out of it. Like so far, like a bit of a dud for somebody who I personally think is capable of winning a couple of these world cups like he could have done it in 2019 he can definitely do it this year uh, agreed i i saw the same thing i was like when he started up the first four bolts of that route i, I was like oh god this is over yeah like i for sure i was like he just looked so on fire and i i felt the same way sorry to interrupt john no that was too, i was just gonna say it's funny that i remember realizing that's two comps in a row where the winner during the interview is like yeah i wish the guy hadn't fallen right because Jacob said the same thing about andra uh when andra slipped at innsbruck and that and then sean kind of said the same thing about alberto which was just kind of cool tyler or tyson that goes back to your original point how you were kind of saying this communal thing you have these guys in the post interview saying like yeah i wish the guy had stayed on longer and like you know fought more um yeah. I, Tyson, I was going to ask you when, when you're having young kids come in and you, a lot of times you hear like a kid like Sean or something that's just like un otherworldly strong naturally just has like something about their, their finger strength or their upper body strength as a kid or whatever. Um, how often is it that you have a kid that comes in and that talent is in footwork, right? Like, does that ever happen when you're just like, this kid has like, innate, like natural footwork because you never hear about that when coaches are talking about kids being phenoms. It's ne it's always about this kid so strong. It's never about like this kid has like some natural, you know, I don't sure. know, footwork. Is that, does that sure. ever happen? It happens uh, in the females. Hmm. Um, we, a lot, a lot of our young females will, end up just naturally having total, you know, razor precision uh, feet. Um, I'll use Meg Coin as an example. Dude, from a very early age, her feet were crazy. They were so good that it actually, it set the tone for most of our young females that came after her, the ones that were able to watch her climb. Because on a climbing team, you have 18 year olds and eight year olds, right? So you got a bunch of eight year olds and nine year olds and 10 year olds looking towards the older athletes. Those are their idols. Those are the ones that they get to be around every day. And those are the ones that they're trying to emulate. Um, a lot of the time it is the young females that have that. Uh, and, and so, yeah, to your, to answer your question, yes, we do see it, but it's generally with the females. There are some, I have a couple right now, a couple of youth D's and a youth C boy or young boys that have just outstanding footwork. And I, a lot of them, you know, they played soccer when they were young or, you know, they ride skateboards and stuff like that. So they're they're pretty uh, foot savvy. But, um, you know, then you get them on the wall and, and it's not their strength that we're talking about. It's their feet. But they're before these ones that I had right now, I was never talking about my boy's feet, man. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, is it my turn to go for the loser? It's your turn, man. Close it out. So it's weird to say this because I agree with everything you cited for Laura Regora being in the winner category, Tyler, but I also want to put her in this category precisely because of what we said. She had like the climb of her life, really. She's able to, to negotiate this route that is her anti-style. She tops the route and it's like, she still does not win. She has to be thinking, 
<laughs> what else do I have to do to win? I topped the route, you know? It like I topped the route, I climbed just you know, perfectly and and Yanya still beats me. Uh I I just, you know, loser is probably not the accurate category because I do think there was just so many there were so many good takeaways from her performance, but yeah, it's like what does she what does she have to do to win? She she did everything that she needed to and yet it still was not enough. And so maybe that speaks to Yanya's greatness more so than than Laura's shortcomings. But um, for those reasons, I stick her in this category. Yeah, I'm just trying to find the uh, the results. But um, yeah, I I don't know. I I, I I definitely feel the vibe. Like it's brutal when you when you get to celebrate, you know, an incredible climb, but it's still not enough. But at the same time, like you know, I think we all know the rules. We all know how it goes in semifinals. Sure. Like guess what? If Yanya is ahead of you going into a finals. <laughs> You, you know, you're probably fucked already, like straight up. Like if you come second on the semis, you probably don't have a chance at this point. You got to, you know, you just got to do better. And so if you want to win finals, you have to win semis. That's just what reality is right now, possibly with Yanni in the field. And if Cheyenne gets here, then, you know, you got to do even better somehow. Um, yeah, I, I feel you on the vibe. But yeah, I think, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's, it's Is this the first time we've had the same person be the biggest winner and the biggest loser for, uh, for the <laughs> same climb? In one week? Well, it's interesting because she's in the loser category for like, but not for anything she did. Like she did everything sure. perfect. It's, you know, it's just like, yeah. it, it wasn't enough. No, she didn't Although, though. She, like, that's what I'm saying is like, well, it's yeah. like with, with this kind of thing where you have somebody who will top every climb and that's like, you know, a 50% chance or higher that they're going to top every route in a comp, you have to do that too. Otherwise it's just not good enough. So, yeah. Totally. Totally. I think Yanya is something we're probably not ever going to see again. Just to be honest, I, I, it's so crazy. She really, I, I truly believe, and I know a lot of people believe this. If you threw her in the men's category, she'd be on the podium as well. Mm. And I just, you know, maybe certain things not, but She's just so next level, man. It, it's going to be really hard to beat for at least the next five years. I want to bring up one topic just because, because uh, you know, we haven't quite hit two hours. So, you know, whatever. But no, I, we'll, we'll kind of do last topic. Um, and it's it's about the root setting styles between bouldering and lead climbing merging. And if there is like what, what the remaining differences between those two disciplines are at this point. Because in the past, aside from like, yeah, one's really endurance focused and one's really strength power focused, um, you know, the, the kind of like typical ways we differentiate between lead and boulder. I feel like a lot of the, not in terms of discrete grades, because obviously the, the climbs on a boulder wall are going to be harder than the sequences on the lead wall. But in terms of style, there's not much separating the two in terms of what kind of movement you're being asked to do anymore. So is the differentiation between the two disciplines now, like, well, one is just, you know, it's really just about endurance and it's a single attempt. And the other one is just a, like not about endurance, but you get multiple tries. Like it does feel like the root setting is, is really not so different anymore. Um, but I'm curious if you guys feel the same way or if you think I'm overblowing it. Whoever wants to talk, or if nobody will just I'll, leave I'll, I'll go, I'll yeah, go, go for it, Tyson. No, 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 I, yeah, sorry. I, uh, what I'm doing right now is they're hitting the nail on the head. I think they tried to do this before, right? I think maybe 17, 18, 19, that's what they were really trying to do, is they were trying to make a more similar um, move, the bouldering. Not that they're trying to make the, the boulders more sport route friendly or whatever. <laughs> they were trying to make the the sport routes more uh boulder like and i they kind of they were missing it and i think they just weren't quite hitting it and now man they're like we were talking about earlier i think they i think they're doing it they figured it out they like it to your point earlier they're doing sections that are more of like uh exclamation points and it's really like here's a boulder and here's a weird full tension rest right not not like a jug and recover and then do another boulder problem it's like full tension rest with some awkward knee bar or like in the case of the men's final with the full press out talking to Sean, he was like, dude, that was the coolest and hardest rest I've ever tried to sit in, mm. but I got enough back to be able to continue on. But let's be honest, if I stayed there much longer, I probably was going to just blow out of there. Um, I, I, I think they've, they've been able to merge it. At least these last two events, they've been able to merge it and it looks 
like they'll probably be able to do it for the rest of the season. And then I, I'm ultimately interested in how it's going to look over the next few years and how that's going to, how that's going to change or, or just even get better. I'm glad you mentioned the rests because that is something that seems like a defining characteristic of this season. I wish I had, I wish I had like on display, I wish I had thought of this Tyler to have like still sh screen grabs of the different rests from the, the routes so far. But yeah, like the press that I have this, image in my head because it, it has become kind of this the iconic photograph for Sean's win of him like scrunched beneath that volume you know like sort of outstretched just kind of resting there at the head wall um, yeah really cool rests I, I think that that's a well said Tyson that's like an aspect of this season that it's easy to think of oh yeah well what they've done is they put kind of these punctuation mark cruxes but they've also put really unique quirky rests in there and I hope that that continues because that um, from a viewing experience, and I guess Sean, it sounds like he liked it from a competitor's experience. Uh, yeah, really cool, funky rest. It's not, it's not what I have. It's not what we think of. Like in my mind, years ago, I have the mental image of like Jain Kim, you know, just like hanging on some crazy crimp, just like shaking out and then switching hands and shaking out and shaking out. It's not that type of rest anymore. It's it's way different. It's way more intricate. Totally. I was, it, it adds a, another dimension. That's yeah. all. It just uh, it adds a really cool dimension to it. And I, that's kind of what I was curious about, John. You mentioned somebody like Jane Kim as this prototypical um, lead climber. Of course, she had some success in bouldering here and there. But it, it, it does feel like, you know, we talked about earlier at the top of this episode how special it was that Sean was one of these very few people to have won a lead and a Boulder World Cup. But because the style is merging, it almost feels like that may become less impressive as all those strengths you have as a boulderer are now really rewarded on the lead wall whereas before it did feel like it was more of just a crimping on rails and not letting go you know for for as long as possible it feels like the that athlete pool between the lead climbing and the bouldering might start to overlap even more than it did in the past and maybe that's something we see more often is is a lot of people who have won you know because there are already a bunch of people that have done it if you if you uh, if you if you look uh, across all the different years, but maybe that just becomes a, a normal thing now, and it's just like two. I, I I guess what I'm well, my original question was just like, what's the value of having both? Like, does one of them just become, frankly, a better event? Like, I know they have strengths and weaknesses right now, but it if it's becoming the same style of climbing, like, why do we have both? I don't know. This I'm just talking out my ass. I'm not even sure if I'm starting a conversation <laughs> or not. But I I think it I think it's just from you know, having an athlete that has now won both, both types of things and knowing him pretty well and how he trains. Um, it's the training for the training is still different is my point. Uh, the climbing style itself is kind of the same, but if you're doing, you know, nine moves of whatever grade into a super awkward rest into another nine moves of, of a certain boulder grade into another awkward rest or however they may end up doing it, you know, down the line, uh, the training itself itself is still incredibly different. Um, I would think that, yes, we will have athletes that are going to be on the podium for both uh, moving forward. I think there's just excitement for that. The, the, excitement from the athlete standpoint as well. Um, you know, most of my climbing team kids, if they had it their way, like they would never get on a rope ever, 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 ever. <laughs> right. They're like, Nope, bouldering only, especially the boys, dude. Uh, it's terrible, yeah. man. They're just, yeah. you know, they just want to sit around take their shirts off and, you know, boulder <laughs> hard, but the, <laughs> but the, um, but the ones that, you know, we of course have a few that are like, no, nah, dude, sport climbing's where it's at. Right. Like sport climbing is the thing that is, you know, uh, uh, something that they want to train for. They're also very good at boulders. And you're going to see a lot of these athletes moving forward and to go all the way back to the beginning of our conversation. The athletes in the United States that are training on the big teams are training for both disciplines. They're training for sport climbing and they're, they're training for boulders. Yes, there's going to be some specialists, but ultimately the ones that are going to do the best are going to be the ones that are training for both. And the way that we look at it at Vertical World Climbing Team, and I know every, you know most of the other teams are looking at it like that too, is that if you want to be a specialist in boulders, you need to train ropes because it's going to help your boulders. And if, you, if you're going to be a specialist in boulders, you need to, or vice versa, uh, mm -hmm. If you want to be a specialist in sport, then you're going to need to train boulders as well uh, because they're merging, of course. But also it's just 
more, uh, again, more tools in the toolbox, man. Just more, more wall time, more ways to climb, uh, better understanding of how your body works. And, and when the situation presents itself mid route, you did that on four boulder problems earlier in the week, that type of thing. And then you'll know exactly what to do. It's interesting because I think of Sean kind of going in the reverse of, you know, as opposed to somebody who's like a really good boulderer and then the route setting starts to, you know, put these kind of bouldery type of moves onto lead walls so that that boulderer then can have success on the lead wall. I think of Sean as, correct me if I'm wrong, Tyson, I think of him as a lead climber or mm-hmm. originally he was a lead climber. And then like I remember when he won the 2019 uh, bouldering open nationals, I was kind of, I was like surprised because I was like, Oh, I thought he was kind of a, a lead specialist for lack of a better word. Now that's not to say I'm sure he had six bouldering success on the local level and regional level and stuff, but, um, right. but it's interesting that he seems to be kind of blossoming now on the bouldering circuit as well. Um, because like you said that a lot of the, the people at your gym, like start as boulderers, that's what the guys want to do. It seems like Sean maybe started as a, as a lead climber and then he's became a boulderer. Yeah, we, we clearly trained both aspects of it and the problem, but just, you're not wrong. He was, he was a sport climbing specialist when he was young, uh, but for no other reason that he was too short. He was real short. And as a, as a youth B athlete, when a lot of your competitors are six feet tall or five, nine, and you're five, two, you're just, no matter how good the root setting is or whatever, you're still getting spanned out. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't start finding success in Boulder events other than locally and regionally, uh, but on a national level until he was like second year a, and he was five, six and has a plus four and was able to and also the root setter started recognizing that too right and because a lot of it especially in boulders comes down to the roots it's always not always but a lot of the time it's hit or miss it's it's depends on what you come out to and the boulders need to line up for you um for sport climbing it's a bit more consistent and at the time it was just mostly resistance roots and he trained like a fiend running laps on laps on laps with weight vests in the gyms uh, you know, for sport climbing, uh, because he found a lot of success at that earlier. Um, but he was also national champion. Don't quote me on any of these years, but he was national champion for boulders, uh, in youth a maybe first or second year, he was national champion in boulders for as a junior. Um, and then obviously all the local stuff and regional stuff and a couple of the open events, stuff like that too. He was, he was doing really well at boulders, but internationally he didn't really find much success until that win in Vail where he was able to get second. And we all kind of knew again, like most of us, we knew it was possible. It just hadn't happened yet. And uh, now we're starting to see it and he's starting to figure out more consistency with it. But yeah, to your point, he was more of a sport climber just simply because he was really short, man. Mm. And do you know his preference now? Uh, he prefers winning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a good, a good so, answer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it really, it isn't one or the other, man. He's looking at it as all the same. And uh, that's uh, one thing after his first, after the Boulder win um, a few weeks ago, uh, you know, in, in a text thread that he and I were having throughout the week, he was like, I think now I can finally prove to everyone that I can do everything. Mm. And that for him was a, he's always felt that way. He's always felt that he could boulder and sport climb and climb outside. And a lot of people have, uh, you know, wondered whether or not that was possible. Uh, You need to focus on this. You need to focus on that, whatever. And uh, he really feels that he can do all the things and do you know, be one of the best, if not the best at all those things. And that's sort of his mentality. So it's not one or the other. Where does that, and I know that like Tyler, I know that we're over two hours here, but like, where does that, um, that compulsion come from to have to like prove to other people? Like, that's an interesting, cause I think of, you know, I love other sports and whenever you're talking about like great athletes from whether it's, you know, Jordan or Lance Armstrong or all these people, there's always like this, I need to prove this to others that like, can you speak to just like where that comes from in Sean? I think ultimately if you are, if you're at the elite level and 
you're thinking the the proving yourself mentality first and foremost needs to be proving to yourself um and that for him is like one of the that's his main uh, uh motivation is proving it to himself that he can do it don't get me wrong though of course he's like dude i should be beating that guy i should you know this guy shouldn't be getting that i should be doing that right there you have to have that competitive mentality towards other people even in individual sports i mean in a, in a fantastic world where you know, everything is, you know, roses and flowers. Like we talk about with the kids, it's like, no, you're not, you, you have no control over anyone else. You're only worrying about yourself. That's what's going on. Dude, the ones that are winning are always thinking about the other competitors for sure. And it's, I, I, I can't speak to whether or not that's good or bad. I just know that it's something that, that the elite, the most elite athletes, that's what they're thinking of. But, you know, you are trying to prove to yourself that you can do it. And in turn, it's, it's almost the same thing, uh, you know, because if you're thinking too much about the other people, dude, you're blown, man. You're never gonna, you're never gonna do your thing, right? Yeah. Well, that's a really interesting yeah. point to end on. Just because I know, you know, before this season, I had a lot of questions about capability, but also like whether he was in it enough, whether he cared enough, whether it was whether comp climbing was sure. his thing. And so, between the two most recent results and now just getting a chance to talk to you for a couple hours, I feel like I have a, a lot stronger faith in uh, in. Sean uh, being somebody that I can like really get behind and hopefully not be uh, let down in the future. I'm, I'm psyched <laughs> to hear that he's really in it. Uh, and I think he's the kind uh, of personality that, you know, I think a lot of people, a lot of climbers relate to somebody like him, whether it's his, his style, his demeanor, his height as a, you know, as a, as a male climber, especially the kids that so man, so many male climbers have to cope with that when they're kids and dealing with those huge height differences as you go through the B and the A category like a lot of them drop out and so hopefully he's somebody yeah, that totally. uh, that can be used as a model so anyway let's call it there um thanks as always to uh 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 sorry i don't know why i started that way first of all thank you to tyson shaney for for making the time and rolling with our multiple delays as we figured out how to make this work so i really appreciate you uh, uh joining us and giving us all that insight it's been awesome no i i appreciate it you guys i really appreciate what you guys are doing and uh you know it's just a bunch of nerds talking about competition climbing and oh, yeah. uh, i th i think this needs to get out there man and the more people that are doing it the more we're building the sport and getting the kids interested and and you know one last thing i do want to say is that it what we really i really want people to think about man is you got to support youth climbing and youth competition climbing and when you're in the gym and you see the kids and you're annoyed because they're on your boulders or they're running around like, dude, just remember that they're all in there and whether they're on a competitive team or not, that that's not what I'm talking about here. But what they're doing is they're following a totally positive path and it's putting them in the right place, moving into a really cool community and a really cool lifestyle that sets the tone for the rest of their lives. And it, I can't stress this enough. If you've got friends who are gym owners and they're not into climbing teams, man, change their mind. It really is such a big deal at our gyms the competition climbing team and what it's doing for the kids all the members like we sell the shirts at the gyms and the members buy them they're like hey you know we're oh man we saw what you guys did last week oh man i saw that you're doing great things oh here i'll just i'll stay over here while you guys finish up over there you know that type of thing and that can happen at every gym throughout the country man and throughout the world and it just comes down to the support from from the gym owners and and the members and you know folks like me and you guys just remembering that we were all kids once too. And if we had something cool like this, you know, if we had something really cool like this, man, you know, you could end up in a pretty cool place. Like the kids that are out there doing it on world cups or just climbing El Cap or whatever, man. I couldn't have yeah, said it awesome. better. Couldn't have said it better. No, for sure. Yeah. Um, John, thanks to you as well for, uh, for always making the time, no matter, uh, no matter when it has to happen, you're always here. And of course, thank you to you, uh, for watching, getting this far into this episode. That means something. You're the kind of person we want to talk to. You're the kind of person we want to watch comps with. So make sure you check out the plastic weekly discord, uh, link in the description below. Of course you can support, uh, plastic weekly on Patreon as well. And, uh, otherwise we're going to be back in, uh, I guess a week and a half ish or whatever. I know the, the schedule gets really weird. Chamonix like Monday, Tuesday or some whack shit like that. So anyway, we're going to be back for Chamonix. We're going to be back for Brianne Son for, the, uh, after that. And of course the Olympics is, uh, is what follows. So we're really getting into it guys. We'll hope we'll see you, uh, in the coming months. Uh, but ultimately, 
we will see you guys in the next episode. Thanks for watching.